Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Cohn. I am the Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Craft and Decorative Arts here at the Flint Institute of Arts. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's artist talk. Before we begin, let's all take a moment to silence our cell phones. First, I would like to thank the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, whose continued support is so important to the FIA's programs and operations. I would also like to thank Huntington Bank. Thanks to Huntington Bank, we have free Saturday admission to everyone every Saturday of the year for Huntington Free Saturdays. Thank you to Genesee County residents. Because of the millage, every county resident has free admission to the museum every single day of the year. Lastly, I would like to offer a huge thank you to Lenore Orlovska Warren and Donald Warren for their support in sponsoring this lecture. Today, we will hear from renowned fiber artist Gerhard Nodell. Introduced to the potential of textiles while studying art, music, and theater as an undergraduate at the University of California, Los Angeles, Nodell went on to complete a graduate degree at California State University at Long Beach. His studio practice spans nearly 50 years, 37 of those spent with Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. From 1970 to 1995, he was the head of the fiber department and from 1995 to 2007, he was director of the Academy. Now director emeritus, Nodell maintains a full-time studio practice in Pontiac, Michigan. His distinguished career of exhibitions, commissions, lectures, and publications has generated significant international recognition. And among his numerous awards are the Michigan Governor's Art Award, the American Craft Council 2018 Gold Medal, and the Distinguished Educators Award from the James Renwick Alliance of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. His exhibition at the FIA includes artworks from his Mingling series, which began in 2015 and continues through today. I am ecstatic that we can show this body of work, which includes a number of artworks that are being exhibited to the public for the first time. It is now my pleasure to present Gerhard Nodell. Thank you, Sarah. What, what a great pleasure to be here with all of you this, on this really lovely day. Um, Sarah, I want to thank you, first of all, for all of the support you've given in uh, bringing this exhibition together and the staff as well, brilliant staff here at the Art Institute who helped to pull this exhibition together I, that I hope all of you have time to spend time with. Um, you know, I, I think it's not a bad idea to begin simply by saying textiles are hot in the year 2022. Um, all of you would agree life can't exist without them, right? Um, imagine your life without textiles. Uh, Yet, it's quite interesting that in the history of contemporary art, especially in the West, textiles have not been up there with the other media as far as great international recognition and importance is concerned. Mm, textiles are always there, they're being used, and through the domestic tradition, there are many people that remain involved with the medium. But we are living in a really interesting moment of time where lots of things are changing radically. I just read an article about artificial intelligence that simply informed me that you could hybridize a teapot with an avocado and by pushing the button you could actually produce that object, an avocado-shaped teapot or a teapot embodied 
embodying an avocado, an amazing trick. The point is not a single human finger, finger touched or hand touched that uh, object as it was being made. Uh, the field of textiles for me began uh, as a child. Uh, imagine this, I was at my grandparents' home in Los Angeles, probably at the age of uh, seven or eight, and my grandparents were wonderful hosts and had delicious Sunday dinners, and all the family needed to be gathered every Sunday around the table. Um, I made it through the main course, but as soon as I had opportunity, I slipped off the chair under the dining room table where I was in a magical world created by lace tablecloth that hung round the uh, space that I was in, the huge voluminous legs of the table, the legs of all the people that sat around the table. And for some reason or other, I, I still remember that sensation today, one that's really important. And I would say one that I have tried to recreate along the way. That memory really opened up to me an interesting question about the way we live with textiles. This pliable element that uh, accompanies our lives in terms of clothing and furnishings and so on. What could be done with it that to move it in relationship to our living experiences in ways that are somewhat different from all of the familiar applications that we know about. Uh, I had the good fortune of moving to the campus at Cranbrook Academy of Art uh, in 1970, it seems like yesterday. Um, and at Cranbrook, I had years of pleasure of working with many of the most outstanding graduate students uh, who have gone on to do great work that expands the textile field. Um, after being there for 10 years, I needed to take a break. And at that point, I found a studio in Pontiac, a building that I was going to rent, and then finally decided to make the big leap. And um, it was a really wonderful move. Um, I thought I'd begin with this image, simply showing you what that studio looks like as I left it a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, the studio, as many of you who are practicing artists may know, is a place of refuge in this very bizarre and contentious, contentious world in which we're living today. For me, it's an extraordinary opportunity to use the key that opens the door to a private realm, one where every decision that is made, every move that is made, is really a result of my own action. I don't wait for anyone to give me the go signal. I don't wait anyone for anyone to approve what my actions are. I am personally responsible for all of that. I've learned along the way to use the following idea to kind of guide a lot of my work. And that is that the artist really is only as good as the next thing that one makes. Um, so I undertake various projects, explore them, and many of them have a way of completing themselves from my in my relationship with them and opening up other doors. And that's the exciting part of this experience and certainly is an exciting part of being able to present the work that we're showing here in the Flynn Institute of Arts. Uh, I have to show you one photograph of me uh, behind the loom so at least you get the idea that this guy weaves he does a lot with every kind of imaginable textile techniques, uh, explored in variety of ways over the years. Um, 
this uh, technology, interestingly, is becoming of interest to a lot of young people today. There's something about the connection between threads that are disciplined and parallel as they stand on the loom and the digital world. Uh, worth thinking about for those of you that have not considered that. Now, this exhibition for me, it came, couldn't have come at a more wonderful time that I didn't realize when the initiation, when the, the, the invitation was first initiated, but began to think about weeks later. When I realized that in 1972, I was invited to bring a large collection of the work that I had taken from Los Angeles to Cranbrook for the first museum exhibition that I've had here in Michigan. And subsequent to that exhibition, the director of the Flint Institute of Arts at the time came to see it and contacted me afterwards and said, Gerhardt, we would love to have that work here in Flint. So this year marks exactly 50 years since that connection was made. And I thought it would be fun to kind of show a couple of images in these couple of black and white photographs that indicate that early work was done as I was attempting to use textiles to shape space, to create architectural uh, new ways of solving the, the issues of interior architecture uh, by using f this pliable medium. So these are canopies, a uh, variety of types, and this one is a dining environment. It's the, 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 the slide, the black and white slide doesn't do it justice. It's actually all sparkling white. And if you look toward the back wall of that room, you can see that there are mirrors that are inset into the fabric. My idea was to create an environment where the guests who are seated in front of this uh, dining structure, which is compressed in this view. You have to imagine it opened up with a table in the middle, but they are there waiting for dinner. The hostess goes to the button on the wall, pushes it, curtains go up, guests move into that space, take their seat around the table, and because it's all white with mirrors, the mirrors are reflecting the color of the uh, clothing that the people are wearing, so that the occupants of the space actually become an important part of defining what the environment looks like. And one other, this is a series of called flexible wallpaper. These are uh, silk, silk panels of silk organza that have been printed with, uh, and pl printed and flocked, and then cut so that they hang independent of each other parallel to the wall, a few uh, inches away from the wall, casting beautiful shadows and giving the possibility for you, you, you know what normal wallpaper is, the image is stuck to the wall. In this case, these panels are flexible and it allows the viewing audience, the owners, to uh, reconfigure them, to change their own environment. I also did lots of works at various times exploring the dimensionality that is possible with textiles. How do you take a single rectangle of textile off of a bolt of fabric and move it into space? How can you allow the textile itself to take on a, a three-dimensional sculptural form in space? Uh, this is called Act Eight, and here you can see it with a couple of people in a little installation, a place fri for Friday night cocktails. You open the window, the cool air blow blows in the wind, uh, blows in the window on a beautiful summer day, and you are there with a group of friends sitting on the floor, of course. This was 1970s um, in order to uh, enjoy their company and the environment. This idea for suspending the textile was taken to some major exhibitions uh, in Europe, including the Lausanne Biennial of Textile, the world's major tapestry exhibition. And in this case, I took the tapestry off of the wall with these huge arcs uh, spanning a 40-foot space and giving the audience the opportunity to enter the gallery by walking between them, almost feeling the extension of the body as a butterfly feels its wings. Uh, and many of you may have attended 
um, the uh, uh, Renaissance Center when it was built in the city of Detroit, uh, I was invited by the architect and Henry Ford II to drop in one afternoon and take a look at the space. They said, we see you doing something that hangs between that point and this point. That was a 70 foot high space and asked me if I was interested. I said, give me a couple of hours to think about it. Of course, what a fabulous opportunity. Uh, and uh, so this piece called Freefall was created. And another that relates to it at Cincinnati Bell uh, Telephone, all of these are hand-woven panels. I uh, worked with the Churchill Weavers in Berea, Kentucky to produce the, the textiles, but did all of the finishing in my studio, and then suspended these panels in space, almost like slices of reality that begin to suggest a dimensional space that is somewhat architectural, architectural, but as one moves around this atrium space, it's constantly in a state of flux and change. Here's uh, some, I did a number of works that were transparent or translucent walls uh, using textile, which was one of the earliest means for housing human habitation to once again take on this function of uh, dividing space, but uh, allowing the openness of fabric structure to be an important part of its uh, character. Uh, and another. And uh, <clears throat> When I bought the studio in Pontiac, uh, shortly after, uh, that was in 1980, the city of Pontiac hosted the uh, s uh, s super, uh, super Bowl. Super Bowl, yes, so football. Excuse me, I'm having a, a little time out. Um, it was an amazing uh, moment because the city was not exactly in its best form. And to make this downtown look better, whoever it was, the city fathers decided to put artificial flowers and signs on the front of a lot of the empty stores to make them look occupied. They renamed Saginaw Street, uh, Bourbon Street North, and uh, the day of the parade that was held before the opening, it was January, something like January 16th. It was freezing cold, and people of the city were all standing in the shop windows uh, to s escape the cold, and I photographed them there. They didn't look like mannequins, store mannequins. They didn't look like real people. It was really interesting to observe, and that gave me an idea. So Monday after the game, I put a sign in on the tables at the little restaurant around the corner that said, anyone that would like to join me here, uh, please come to the back room where I will take your photograph and you will be part of an artwork. Well, needless to say, a lot of people arrived. And here are some of them and some of the images that I took that day. Um, all of that evolved into this opportunity to incorporate images of human beings in my work. Uh, some of you know about the history of tapestry and how important it was at certain points of European history in particular, but also in Asian textiles, Chinese textiles, to incorporate the image of a human being to kind of show us uh, the potential of that world of textiles of which we are a part in rather poetic ways. So this is called the Pontiac Curtain. Those are abstractions of some of the buildings at the entrance to the, the buildings on Saginaw Street. And uh, you know, you people could, we invited all the people who are in the uh, tapestry to come to the opening when it was first presented at the Cranbrook Museum where they walked across the hall and came to the tapestry and discovered themselves embodied in these textiles. And you can imagine some of the comments. Another work, uh, uh, Powers, uh, the, the, those things, those, those creatures that watch over us, that take care of us. We're very aware of the world ecology these days and these are some tapestries that were woven on, those, on that subject years ago. 
including images of humans that watch over the, the presence of humans that are necessary to watch over the well-being of the earth. Uh, and a, a, a couple of large installations uh, done uh, oh, maybe 15 years ago. This is at uh, Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak. Uh, private rooms were exposed to the atrium, and I decided to do a series of screens. It's a, about 100 feet in length, about 50 feet in height, and each screen provides privacy for the window that is behind it. And next to the bed within each of the private hospital room, there was a map that showed the piece with the language. Can you look closely and you'll see language is incorporated on each level and the language tells the story uh, or, or indicates uh, ideas about health as it's reflected by different cultures around the world. The idea was to help the patient feel connected. Uh, and another project uh, based on a floral garden that is also at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak. If you haven't been there, go to see. You can park and go into the hospital without going in for treatment. I invited you. Uh, oh, here, let me just, oops, there we go. Uh, and then the, the, the last thing is an introduction to the work that I'm showing in this exhibition is just to mention an exhibition uh, that was held uh, several years ago uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. at uh, George Washington University. And uh, this exhibition showed a body of work that I did after I uh, left Cranbrook as the director and returned to my studio where I discovered the challenge that I faced was really starting all over again. I decided immediately on entering the studio, there's no reason to go back and do the things that you've already done or to do things that are kind of close relatives of those. How could I start over? And all of a sudden one day the idea came to me uh, about letting my studio practice be something like game playing. Um, you know, a game is a situation where you get together with a partner and you understand the rules of the game and each of you makes a move in, in relationship to the other and it can be a lot of fun. But remember like the game of chess and you may know in some countries of the world there have even been, has even been warfare that evolved from that chess board and the tension that is created between people who are in opposition to one another. So I like that idea of the uh, the range of reaction that can come from a game and began to develop all sorts of works that responded to uh, the idea of games. Here, this one, do you see the eyeballs on this, uh, uh, in this game? That the, it invites the audience to pick up the eyeball, throw the eyeball against one of those wooden elements, which I see as, as art critics, and as they fall back, like a game played in a carnival, they speak to you and they tell you what the work is and what it is not. And some of the others, just to give you an idea about the range of work that was in this exhibition. Uh, the work is not limited always to textiles. Oftentimes I use other materials, but they are handled through a kind of textile sensibility. Uh, I love patterning, I love uh, rich color, texture, uh, the, uh, the, the composition of so many of the works uh, really come out of a, 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 an experience with organizing textiles, uh, both on the loom and through a variety of other kind of uh, techniques that I've explored over the years. Now, minglings, <laughs> to the point, excuse me, a glass of water, mm. to the point of the uh, exhibition that we're looking at here at the Flynn Institute of Arts. Ah, Minglings, A Journey Across Time. Uh, I talked about that exhibition in Washington, D.C. And uh, when I came back to the studio after the exhibition, I was cleaning, which is something that I always do after an exhibition. There's nothing like getting, clearing the house 
and then going back and kind of getting back. Well, some of you know what that's all about in terms of housekeeping, right? Occasionally, you get into it and you kind of put the world back in order to start all over again. This time, what happened, as I was cleaning of the one of the tables on the studio, I found a, a little plastic bag and inside of it, this textile, which I've had for years, but very interestingly, I don't know where it how it came into my life. Uh, I should mention that I have assimilated a very large collection of historic textiles over the years. I have hundreds and hundreds of pieces from all over the world, places that I've traveled, places that I've picked up examples along the way of textiles that were important in other cultural relationships. Uh, this one, I think you might identify, comes from China. Where did it come into my studio? Well, how did it come into my studio in Pontiac? Honestly, I didn't know. But as it was the case in the past, I usually, open the plastic bag, lay the textile out. It is about, you know, this size or so, 24 by 36. Um, and it's a fragment of a larger piece. And if you look closely, you'll see that it's not in great condition. There are a little, uh, you know, areas of deterioration, little splits in the fabric. There are some repairs. In fact, we're looking at the backside of the textile here where you can see some patches that are sewn to the, sewn to the surface. Well, what was interesting to me, I looked closely and I thought, you know, rather than put it back in the bag this time, I'm going to take a little radical action. So I got a pair of scissors and I, uh, I put some heat bonding on the back of the textile, took a pair, pair of scissors, and I just cut out small rectangles from the, uh, the original textile, keeping the parts that were good, and then just tossing the rest of it away. Um, I had about 40 pieces, and they were on the table of my studio, where I looked at them for a couple of days, look, and looked carefully. Here is a, this is a wonderful photograph, right? Getting close to the textile, even closer than what most of you could see if you were actually looking at the real document, which is only about, uh, you know, three by four inches. You can see that the textile is made of silk, all beautifully hand-spun silk, and dyed, the background dyed in indigo. Do you see the striations in the indigo? The striations are from various ways of exposing the yarn to the dye bath. So you get this rich uh, col uh, culture, uh, sorry, rich col color, uh, suggestive of a kind of heavenly sphere in which all sorts of meaningful subjects are uh, uh, arranged. And here are a few of them from a few of the other squares. These are, you know, little details off of butterflies that happen to be floating in that ethereal uh, space. Well, after looking at those squares on a table for a couple of days, I had an idea. Let's take one of them and attach it to a piece of drawing paper and then play this game of exquisite corpse. Some of you know what it is. You take a sheet of paper, you fold it in thirds, and you draw the head of a person. Then you fold one part of it back, you pass it to somebody else, they draw the, the torso of the person, and then you fold it back again, somebody else draws the legs, then you open it up to see what it looks like, and voila, you've got a creature that none of you could have anticipated, but nevertheless have created in a kind of partnership. So here, what I did was to paste that uh, a small fragment to the center of the drawing paper and then use it to indicate what I should do in extending it, in extending the, the fragment in ways that it could never have anticipated. Um, so uh, just to capture the spirit of the movement, that was the goal in this first one. Adjacent to that is the second drawing. These are all eight and a half by, by 10 sheets of paper. And do you see the fragment up there in the upper right hand corner? So that small bit, which is about an inch by an inch and a half, is pasted in the top corner of the drawing paper. And then what was there in the piece suggested the configuration that followed. And here, look at the, oh, this is the, I, this is one I really like. 
uh, in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, you can see the butterfly wing that was part of the original and what I did as an extension of it, which all of a sudden opened up a field of awareness to me. Because when I was finished with this, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that looks as if the original Chinese designer could actually have come up with that, uh, with that image. But I know it was not in, within the culture to do the kind of response that I had created. So all of a sudden, I'm feeling as though there's a collapse in time between my time and the time in which the original textile was made. And actually, I'm reaching my hands across the water to China, to the studio where this original textile was made, and holding hands with that person and creating something in the space between. That notion of collaboration then was really what spurred on the entire project that follows. Uh, so here you see uh, those first uh, four drawings that I've shown you, now comprising uh, a folding book. And that as I began to do six of these and put them together, I thought, well, they're starting to tell a story. I mean, I could begin on the left where the story begins, or I could begin on the right. And do you see a kind of figurative reference, a portrait reference that he's actually the na narrator of the story, kind of telling you about what's going on. And I like the fact that what's going on is not specific. Uh, so specific that you can unravel it and exactly un and understand exactly what I have intended. What I'm attempting to do is to put out a series of possibilities for you to react to, for you to see the narrator, which is on the far left, uh, bringing forward a cast of characters that all move to that beautiful blue area in the center, soon to be confronted by the army of other creatures that are coming in from the right. And there's this sense of suspension in time where both of them are going to meet, but we don't know what's, what the result of that is going to be. Uh, stay tuned in your imagination. You can come back to another version of conclusion to that story every time you look at it. <clears throat> the relationships in those drawings then suggested to me, get on with the business of working with textiles. How can those small drawings be interpreted at a larger scale? So this is one of the first large pieces I did. You'll see it in the exhibition. It's about eight feet in width. Uh, and in this case, I came up with an idea to represent the shading that I had in the drawings. You can see the color modulation, like in the pinks and the orange areas. And what I came up with, let's see if it's in the, oh, well, no, I'll show you in a minute what I can. I came up with the idea of creating these little tabs and using them almost in the form of a, of a mosaic and then building the image based on one of the drawings uh, with textiles, except for the part that in the drawing was the actual textile. And then the question is, well, how to represent that? Should I imitate it? Should I try to represent it through my own means? And then it occurred to me, why not use photography for that means? Photography, part of the 20, 21st century technology that we're using uh, extensively today. And what I then did was to get involved uh, with an assistant and we worked on these, enlarging these very small fragments into these very large sized photographs. And notice when you walk into the gallery, at a distance, you probably think these are actual weavings. Um, it's only when you get close to them that you realize that they are photographic. And the other beautiful thing about them, in those huge enlargements, you see more of the original textile than you can if you're, you're using your normal vision to look at the small fragment on which that whole image is based. So this was the first of a series of works called It Had to Be You. Oh, and I wanted to show you how that technique of those small increments that I came up with relates to the texture of the original silk fabric on which I'm, that I'm responding to. 
And here on the table, you can see that piece. Uh, it had to be you in process, the various parts of it. And then little piles of those tabs, they're made by sandwiching uh, uh, several layers of fabric around a, a core of felt. They're heat bonded together, and then I use a pair of scissors to cut them into those scallop forms and create piles with different colors that are then my resource in building these, uh, these images, uh, combined with, with other techniques that you can see. See the drawing up there uh, just near the top of the, uh, the, top of the screen? Uh, that's what I'm enlarging in this piece, so you get a sense of the huge scale shift. And these are the byproducts of my cutting. Uh, I have to show this to you because most people in seeing this work, the first thing they say is, how long does it take to make these? And secondly, uh, what kind of machine did you go to to cut out all of those things? I'm very happy to say that in the exhibition, every single scallop you will see <laughs> in all of those works was machine, uh, was a scissor cut by this hand, the right one, and, uh, and I have saved over the a long time I've been working on these, all of the byproducts, which are quite beautiful in their own right. Uh, the first one suggested some others. So this is another, it had to be you. Each of these has their own name. The first one is called genomia. In other words, it's evolved off of the genome idea. So I've taken the idea of the original textile as being, being the DNA for all of this. And then what I'm doing is giving birth to something that is created by that original uh, image and uh, letting it evolve in my own imagination. Uh, so, so each one of them has their own, this is called Legacia, legacy in other words. Another of them is called Marvolia. It's a marvel that this thing evolved <laughs> off, of, off of its source. Now, my goal was in this new body of work to find new imagery and I hope you see it. I had never seen any, I had never made anything like this. I'd never seen these images before. And so all of a sudden they were big. I was living with them in my studio and I was beginning to feel that I was starting to create an environment kind of reflective. Go back to the original textile. It's a blue field with things that are kind of floating in space, creating an imaginary world in which Mm, the viewer's eye can penetrate and in your imagination and what you know about the symbols that are represented by the subjects, they can take you to places you haven't been. And in that process, it was absolutely necessary that I make some of my own individual characters that could be arranged in a gallery on walls and begin to create within the exhibition itself a sense of the free-floating open quality of the original textile. So each of these is a, an independent piece. Each of them has its own story and uh, each of them has its own character, but I like to see them in groups as you can see here in this, in this photograph, each skirting about the space of the, uh, the exhibition and complementing some of the other works that are in the exhibition, as you will see uh, here in this show. Uh, those objects uh, also had to find their way into broader compositions. Uh, so this is one work, which you'll also see in the exhibition, called Eclipse. And, uh, you see the disc to the, on the right-hand side, the orange arc. I mean, to me, that's kind of like a planet or sun or something rolling into a space uh, to be between two layers of space. One, a window in the foreground, that red shape, behind it, free-floating panels. And I like the idea of these floating butterfly-like forms as belonging to those white panels in the distance. They had floated free. Maybe those, those panels in the background are home base for them. And they float free, but they go back. They, got it, they, they belong in that deep space. Um, you know, it's all part of these fantasies that one creates. 
what ifs, I call them. You know, what if this, what if that? How do you know unless you make it? And this one is called Homecoming. I'm anxious for you to see this because it's one of my favorite pieces, especially in terms of the richness of, uh, of uh, surface that is created by those tabs. You know, I didn't mention another connection to China in this project is the fact that all of these textiles I'm purchasing at Joanne Fabrics. Uh, they are af available, affordable textiles, and my goal is to transform them in a way that has not been seen. Uh, so I like the idea that the textiles are connected to this Chinese history, which is part of the source of my original textile, of course. And in this piece, which is called Homecoming, I wanted to be able to really play up the beauty of those individual tabs. And you'll see in the exhibition, as you look at the work, that as you shift the tab relative to the source of light, it reflects light in a wide variety of ways. And so a great richness of surface is created. But in terms of the imagery, you can see the arcs here all create a kind of architectural setting, which is based in some of the arcs that were on the original textile, but in this case arranged to create a sense of the place that all of those free-floating individual pieces reside. And uh, so there is the potential of connecting some of them to these pieces as well. Do that in your imagination as you go through the exhibition. Now, something interesting. Oh, more water. Just a moment. Mm. Excuse me. Something really interesting happened along the way. About a year into doing some of this work, I thought, here I'm making all of this work. I've got to know more about that original textile. I assumed that it was made in the Qing, Qing Dynasty, perhaps late 1900s or in, uh, into the 20th century and perhaps made by a workshop that made stuff for tourism, because there was a lot of that going on in China at that period of time. I decided I better have that history checked out. So I contacted John Vollmer, a wonderful uh, historian of Chinese textiles in New York, sent him some photographs and said, John, tell me about this. this is, these are my thoughts, what are yours? He contacted me and said, oh, Gerhard, this piece that you are working with is not from the Qing Dynasty, it's much older. It actually was made in the Ming Dynasty. It could be, uh, you know, that's, that goes back to the 1600s, early 1700s. And uh, he said, you know, it's quite uh, an important textile. He said, he, in fact, in all of his research and work that he's done with collections all over the world, he's only seen one other example of that particular uh, textile. I said, wow. He said, yeah, it's in a Paris collection. And he sent me a photograph of it. And um, he said, let me tell you something more, what makes these pieces so special. They were woven in China, but they were never used there. there. They were exported probably to Macau, where they were put on Portuguese ships and taken all the way to Portugal, where in Portugal they were sold to middlemen who provided them as access to, for wealthy families to use in creating bed hangings and bed covers. Well, you can imagine how elegant the bed was, all this gorgeous, beautiful, fine Chinese silk creating an environment for sleeping. Well, the problem with the textile is, is that it's very fragile if exposed to light and uh, extreme conditions of humidity over long periods of time. And as a result, this textile, the piece of which I owned, which is now hundreds of years old, uh, did not survive. And uh, so John indicated that this piece was very special and he said, I hope you have some good pieces of it because they are worth quite a lot these days. Well, of course, by that point I had cut up the piece. I had my 40 little pa panels, but the point being, 
Well, if anybody ever wants the drawings, they get a real Ming fragment with them. Uh, so John f went on to tell me another part of this story that I thought is, was most impressive. He said, you know, the textile was not used in China, but exported. And I thought, wow. You know, we're living in a period of time where we think a lot about migrating populations. Remember a couple of years ago, the focus was on all of those boat people leaving Nor North Africa and trying to get across the Mediterranean to Greece or Italy. And um, many of them losing their lives along the way. Uh, the, the idea of ma migration continues on the south of the southern border of the United States. Diverse ideas about all of that. Generally speaking, most people I would think, most people I can think of, <laughs> treat the idea of migration as kind of a sad circumstance where one is uprooted from an environment and forced to make change that is not always a welcome change. And certainly at the receiving end, uh, it is not welcome. But I began to think about it in a little bit of a different way. What if we think about objects migrating mm. or the memory of objects? Each of us has in our experience memories of textiles that are related to us. Maybe it's grandmother's uh, doilies that she knitted, or maybe it's embroideries that somebody did, or maybe it's special clothing that came from a special event. You know, it depends where in generations past you are making these connections. Uh, the point is that textiles carry memory, and memory oftentimes of qualities of beauty that enhance life experience. So what intrigues me is this whole notion that uh, you can make this kind of a transfer from textiles rather than thinking about them as victims in, that migrate, are leaving home against their will. Think about them as carrying the values of the people that made them and transferring them to other people in other parts of the world. So here is a, a tapestry a French tapestry uh, that I found uh, in London a couple of years, or yeah, a couple of years ago. And one of the details showing the uh, rocky coast, the stormy sea, the ship that is coming across the water, uh, and all indicating the kind of danger of this passage, but the whole idea that on board might be some of these memories that I'm talking about. And as a result of that, that story, I needed to do a series of works that were based on the idea of migration. So this is the first of three very large panels. Uh, they're about, uh, what, about 11 feet in height. Um, and uh, I, here I'm trying to depict a, a sensation of the sea. In the foreground, there is a blue orb that I see as the essence of whatever it is that is being transferred, this notion of beauty through objects. Uh, and then in the distance, you can see uh, a skyline indicating some sort of landforms, which might be the goal. And up above, the flower that is floating becomes kind of like the, um, the, the beautiful angel that we oftentimes see in religious artworks. The, the embodiment of uh, the, the uh, the uh, system of belief or the optimism that uh, religion can bring into our lives. In this case, the flower kind of is leading the way. It's, it's floating up there in the sky saying, keep going, keep going, and you'll arrive at the destination. And you can see the entire piece is made up of those uh, tabs that I talked about earlier. Uh, I should mention the flower is directly taken from the original textile. It's one of the numerous uh, images in, in the original piece. 
and note here the inner layer of, uh, of felt in each of those tabs so that as you move past the textile, it's really very rich in terms of the variety of sensation and color that is generated. The second of the three panels takes the Voyage mid-range. Uh, uh, mid you can see uh, these a complicated pattern of uh, lines racing through the space of the dark night sky, all rendered in yellow, which I feel is very Chinese yellow. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, the sense of the moon that is kind of leading the way and down below the prow of the ship, the suggestion of it. And then this flower, which is kind of at the front of the ship, the ball that is shipboard, that is what is being transported. The, the flower form, which is quite large in, in size here, is an abstraction of the flower, which is of course leading the, uh, the journey. I wanted to embody the energy of, and the excitement of the people on board of the ship as they are arriving closer to the destination. Aha, uh -huh. more <laughs> byproducts. And here is the last stage uh, of the arrival of the textile in Lisbon, where I imagine a group of people who are designers, perhaps the textile designers, because they did have a, a great textile industry there, saw these Chinese textiles and said, wow, we've never seen anything like that. And I try to imagine what's in their minds as they see something that's strange and is foreign, but are inspired to incorporate its influence into their work. So the background here has a repeat pattern of the flower motif, which is similar to the way the European design or the, the Portuguese design would have handled a lot of their subject matter in the textiles produced at the time, superimposed with a transparent curtain that echoes some of the images behind, kind of creating a vague sensation, almost like a cloud that is floating over this space, uh, suggestive of that state of mind where inspiration enters your world, but you don't know exactly where it's going to go, but it, it, is, it is a profound potential. Uh, and as you look at the piece in the gallery, I think you'll see the richness of the surfaces of the patterned uh, rectangles in the background, all based on uh, the tradition of tiles, uh, white tiles painted with blue images that are used on many of the buildings in Lisbon, uh, part of a very rich history uh, there, always depicting stories about the history of the city and the religion that is practiced there. Oh, pardon me. Let's go back. So you can see the three, three uh, panels together as they are in this exhibition. All right, that's my studio. You see it down there, that little thing? It looks like it's off of a Monopoly board or something, but uh, that building, uh, the, the first one, the, the three-story building, and the little one next door, those are mine. The McLaren Hospital is across the street. At the corner is the tallest building in downtown Pontiac. Um, I've had this studio now since the, the first building since 1980. Uh, shared it with a few other artists uh, over the years, which has been a great pleasure. And uh, I mentioned earlier about the project that I did with the Pontiac Curtain that incorporated the figures. But now I'm thinking, hey, Gerhard, you're dealing with this project that originated in China took that long, several thousand mile journey by boat to Lisbon, how can you drop it off in Lisbon? The whole thing has got to come back to your studio, the place where this entire project originated. So, uh, oh, I had to show you, this is the building, the little building when I first got it. It's built in the 1870s. I'm proud of the fact that I did all of the renovation. Um, but, uh, and then the, the front of the, my two buildings. Come and visit sometime. <laughs> oh, and I showed, 
I have to see this. Look here. Do you see the red bricks? Look at that edge of my building, right? And now go remember that. And then go to this slide. This is the Pontiac Gazette that was started in 1873 in Pontiac. And can you see over on there on the left side of the, the slide, the corner of my building? Ah, I love that moment where uh, moments of history kind of come together and you, you know, your moment in time suddenly becomes, you know, you reach out, you reach more broadly than you have in, in the past. Uh, so as a result of the commitment to Pontiac, I decided to do a work that brought that project, the textile, back to the city where I was working. Here you can see one of the stages in the project that I developed. This is uh, a, 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 um, a series of rectangles that were originally all together as one piece, depicting a map, an aerial map of the downtown, of downtown Pontiac. The map that I found in the Historical Society was in black and white, and I incorporated the color. There's a little diagonal in the center, lower part of the, uh, the group, which is Woodward Avenue, if, for those of you that are familiar with the territory. And my studio is kind of in the center of the, the whole project. And taking this uh, series of elements, I decided to utilize the idea of a series of kites. Uh, kites being something that flows, it floats in space, you know, metaphorically it was kind of connected to the idea of the transportation of this original textile. And so I uh, created a work of 28 kites, which have as their primary imagery that map of the city of Pontiac, which is superimposed by this huge flower, and by this time you know where that flower originated. And the idea being that this is a view that might be seen from an aerial perspective as one is considering this territory as a place of potential. Now, what I've, the other part of the project that was exciting to me was to make this with a specific idea of use in mind. And that is to get together uh, 28 people who owned buildings along Main Street, have an event where I tell them about the the history of this piece, and then give one section of this uh, work to each of them with the idea that they install it someplace visible in one of their buildings with the uh, commitment that they never try to bring it back together with any of the other parts again. In other words, to let this whole project end with the textile going back out into the community in which I'm living and working and be part of other people's lives in that way. Uh, now, finally, I will show you a few images of uh, some work that has followed the kite uh, project. It's called Sky High over Pontiac. Um, I did some, some works with small elements that were actually pattern pieces that I'd used for some weavings that I did years ago. And as the pandemic came to us a couple of years ago, um, it suggested to me some possibility of visualization. And for some reason, I pulled out bags of those little small pieces, created some vinyl uh, or uh, 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 yeah, like vinyl envelopes, and uh, inserted the pieces in the envelopes. Then with machine stitchery, held them in place, superimposed some drawn lines, which, which suggested containers. And all of that then led to the next series of ideas. Uh, when the pandemic began, uh, it, it occurred very close to a very big birthday that I had <laughs> two years ago. And that birthday was on February 21st. Uh, after the birthday, which was supposed, supposed to have a big party, but it didn't work out because things were kind of in the air and changing, we went to uh, New Orleans for Mardi Gras for five days. I came home, then I went to Seattle and to do a master's class. And while in Seattle, oh yeah, 
that's where the pandemic began. Do you remember on the pages of the newspaper? All of that, those stories, suspicion, what's going on here, virus first sighted, etc. That suggested to me that something big was going to happen. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I had a feeling. When I went home, I had accumulated all of the New York Times that had been delivered, because I forgot to cancel the delivery, had been delivered to my house. So I had them from February 21st, which was my birthday, and I decided to do a drawing that utilized, and I'm going to direct you here to the lower left-hand side, that was the first one, a, an image of the flower. It's an abstraction of the flower. So the flower is at the center, the four leaves and the stem, and it floats on uh, the surface of the vellum on which it's drawn above a flower pot. Uh, you know, the flower pot, you know, when you go to a nursery to buy a plant, the plant looks at you as you look at it and you try to develop a partnership if you get so excited and you put down your money and so on. And uh, finally, you take it home and you hope for the best with fingers crossed and your watering can in hand. It doesn't turn out exactly as you may have expected. That's usually the case in our house. But uh, here, I like that idea of the greenhouse and plants with the potential of being able to live in a way that we don't have control over, that we share with them. So in the background uh, behind the drawing with, of the flower pot and the flower is a piece of the new, front page of the New York Times with a, a section of a headline text that streams in front of it, and at the top, the date of that panel of front page newspaper. So I did the first one, and then I thought, well, this, I've never done anything like this. I'll do a second. So I did a second. And as you go up the row on the left-hand side, that was the first group, each one done one day in succession. And then it continues here on the lower right-hand side and continues through. So this is half of the, the number of projects uh, that eventually evolved. And uh, I'll show you a few uh, details here so you can see the character of the flower. For me, I, I have never done a lot of drawing as an end product in, in my work. Drawing was usually done as a means to visualize ideas for uh, constructing something. Uh, but this kind of excited me. And, uh, in each case, I almost feel as though I could take the character of those drawings and transform them into patterns for textiles or for, you know, ideas for, for lots of other, uh, having a lot of other kinds of application. Along the way, uh, after I made 30 or 40 of these, these eyes began to appear. Do you see them there? Those little eyes that kind of, so the plant is there. There's still the sense of the flower and the leaves and so on. But now that structure starts to look out, look at you as a member of the audience. And I like that idea. And here is, we're moving toward the end of the series and you can see that they evolve into portrait like panels. Each one of them have its own character. Now remember these, don't start out to draw a portrait. They start out with the shape of the flower, and then I start mark making, and the mark making grows into those images. So that was interested, interesting to me, that the human image could emerge out of this flower form. And finally, I had to complete the series. <laughs> and uh, so these are the last two panels. The last one you can see is an open mouth, you see the teeth, the lips, the whole thing with the flower located in the center of the mouth as though exhaling from the mouth with a suggestion of the virus all around. As you'll, you'll see in the exhibition, all of these panels are now uh, presented here on the wall as a series. It takes a little time and a little exercise to go close to them and get involved in them uh, one by one, but I hope you... Uh, indulge. Um, and here, just experimenting with those drawings, I 
made miniature uh, reproductions of them, and set up something that looked a little like something you would find in the greenhouse. And that turned on another idea, and that is the whole notion of the place where these drawings would be seen. And I began to think of it in terms of a reliquary. Um, and in this case, the reliquary is inspired by in a uh, Middle Eastern uh, object that was carried on the back of a camel that housed the remnants of the Kaaba that is found in Mecca after each year after the, the big migration takes place. And the rulers of various parts of the, that world are sent home panels from the black covering that had been cut apart and distributed uh, as it is done each year. And so I thought, what about creating a kind of reliquary that is tent-like and that houses the images that I had created in the series of drawings, all set up in a kind of circumstance to help the audience feel as though they had entered, discovered something here, they read through the sequence of images and begin to get, begin to get into the spirit that of the situation that we've all experienced during the pandemic. And uh, here another idea against, shown against the uh, wall of the, the drawings. Walking, you're walking through Central Park, you're following the black path. As you can see below, eventually the black path turns into the flower and growing out of the center of the flower is this huge stalk. And along the surface of the stalk, are small images in here, but they would be rendered very large in actual size of that last image in the series, the open mouth. Notice though, that during the daytime or when illuminated at night, the exterior of the piece broadcasts those drawings like, bill, like a billboard. But as you walk to the center of this structure, the interior of it is uh, completely devoid of those images, except for the ones on that central panel. The images are all black, and uh, the sense of void is very strong. And then the third of these is kind of a carnival-like uh, uh, object. Um, you can see it here, it's like a merry-go-round, and uh, the the audience is invited to go up the stairs and take a seat on one of those cone-shaped things and then the platform turns and as it turns you can see in front of it you see the sequence of those drawings at the same time you look down into the pit which uh, has the title of the piece the greatest show on earth uh, and below it the pit is entirely black made out of a black reflective glass uh, sand. Uh, again, the idea of moving through these states that we move through when we're confronted by this kind of threat that we've all experienced over the last couple of years. And then uh, I happened to uh, have in my possession this quilt from uh, China from Hainan and uh, I looked at it one day and I thought, wow, look at how these abstractions of flowers and can you see there's some uh, other kinds of images here. There's even the butterfly and there's some bugs and so on. The character of those were kind of connected to what I was doing. So I took the vellum and I superimposed it over individual squares and transferred some of the images through the vellum from the Hainan textile, combined it with my flower. Can you see it there floating in the center of the, the uh, container? And um, this entire, uh, the, the goal here was another kind of emergence. Um, the, the, the piece had been intended, the original piece had been intended as a quilt, and so I configured these components also in kind of a quilt-like arrangement, uh, bringing the past, the other culture, together with me and my moment and my interests. And then finally, in the exhibition, you'll see 
the, a couple of uh, newer uh, works. Uh, these are, um, are both coming from those uh, folding book uh, screens. And what I just encourage you to do is to get involved as you look at them in the whole idea of storytelling. I mentioned that earlier, but uh, this notion of uh, using the textile to create a world of poetry and that has been done in many cultures around the world. I can think of Peru, I think of Indonesia, Sumatran textiles, Chinese, of course, I've mentioned, Japanese, etc. Even Native American textiles and uh, textiles from Central and South America. You know, all cultures of the past have embedded imagery into their clothing and the objects that they live with that help to extend their lives in meaningful ways through association with images that are extraterrestrial. They are beyond the life that these people are living, but significant in influencing that life. And that has been the pleasure of my work and uh, is certainly the pleasure of this exhibition. Thank you very much. Thank you.